Well, thank you so much for your company this morning. According to the New Zealand Police, around 8,000 people go missing in New Zealand each year. 95% of those are found within 14 days. But there is a small number who remain who just stay missing. Author Scott Bainbridge joins us now to tell us all about his new book, The Missing Files, which details some of these cases. Welcome back to the cafe, Scott. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, we had you here last year, wasn't it? Talking about your last book, which was The Great New Zealand Robbery. Yeah. And now you're back with your sixth book. Yeah, well, um, the last couple of books that I've written have been about more historical New Zealand yeah. crimes, but um, every book I, I, or author or event I go to, people tend to ask me about missing people, which was the subject of my first two books, which um, came out 2005 and 2008. Yes. So um, I thought it was time to revisit those um, that those books, and um, so this, in effect, is a an updated version of the interesting cases in those earlier books, plus I've added in six new ones. You've got updated information as well? Yeah, yeah. Cool. You are renowned as being one of the foremost true crime writers. You've had the TV show. And I know that as a result of your work, some cold cases, I think, have been reopened. Was that a, an intentional thing with your work, or is that kind of a byproduct? Well, um, with when the, the first book came out, it spurred a lot of interest. And, um, and then when the, the TV show, The Missing, came out, um, it, people obviously watch the TV program and TV open, tends to open a lot of doors so uh, mm. we received a lot more information, even official information about some of the cases which um, which we did pro get progress on. How did you start it? Because you're not, that's, you, that's not your background is it? No, Journalism no. Journalism isn't your background. No, you're no. not a writer but then you started writing these incredible books. Oh look I've always had a, a, a love of writing and, um, and a lot of the jobs that I've done have, have been sort of legal writing type thing I, I suppose you could say. And I had an interest in unsolved murders, um, old crimes in New Zealand, and so I thought I'd sort of combine the interest and the skill and um, come up with the idea of a book, and I was just fortunate that they, it was picked up. When you go and talk to these people, because obviously you have to go and talk to the people who are around or who yeah. have survived or who are still there, how do you approach those cases and do they talk to you? Because you're not the police, you're yeah. not a journalist. Well, that's, uh, that's probably the hardest thing, particularly with a lot of the older cases when you're, you're contacting people out of the blue who've lost somebody or a member of their family yeah. many, many years ago and saying, hey, look, I want to find out a little bit more about it. With missing people, it's um, it's interesting because after a certain period of time, um, when the information dries up and the media interest dies down, um, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of the families I've talked to um, are quite happy because it um, for the interest in the, in the book yeah. um, because it rejuvenates a little bit more publicity. So let's mm. take a look at some of the cases in the book because I think they go back as far as 1945. Yep. In this book, so what what was that case? Well, the, um, the earliest case I wrote about in this book was um, was the, the disappearance of Jean Martin, who was a student in Wellington who disappeared. She went for a Sunday stroll in the Wilton bush with a friend, and she went back into the bush. Um, very briefly, and but she was never seen again. And and the uh, the investigation, it, um, well, she disappeared sort of the last week of the Second World War, mm. and um, and so a lot of the news was and the interest was focused on on that. And um, but the, the the police did do a reasonably big search, and I managed to track down some people who were university students at the time, who who did look for her, you know. But um, th there had been some sightings of a woman in the Walton's Bush, but found out later that um, it was somebody else that had been for a stroll. I covered this particular case in my second book, Still Missing, mm. and it was after that that somebody got in touch with me to say, hey, um, Jean's sister is st still alive, Peggy. So I was able to talk to Peggy, who's in her 90s, um, when I um, updated this wow. particular chapter. It was really interesting because I thought that um, in the 1940s, um, it would be relatively easy for somebody to, to disappear because, yeah. you know, there's no internet or... Uh, there's probably radios in, in mm. most houses, mm. but um, it would, I would have thought it would have been reasonably easy to slip off the radar. But um, Peggy explained to me that back during the war, um, there was such a shortage of manpower services, and if you wanted, to, or if somebody wanted to go and um, start a new life or move to a new town, you had to actually consult the authorities and mm. you know write out forms and triplicates. So people generally know new people's movements, yeah. particularly during the war. So it would have been very difficult for somebody to just 
disappear mm. like that. Mm. Uh, now, one of the most recent cases in the book is a Beckenridge case. John Beckenridge and his stepson Mike, uh, yeah. last seen in the Catlins in Southland, what, 2015? Yeah, um, yeah t uh, three years ago. Yep. Yeah. Now, look, I didn't have too much involvement in that case, um, but I decided to cover this one in this book because it was really interesting and it was recent. It was in the news for weeks. Yeah. Um, because it was a, a more of a recent case, I didn't get a lot of information out of the police because obviously of being so recent and they're still ongoing investigations. But I was interested that not a lot of people actually wanted to sort of talk to me on record. So mm -hmm. I did, the, the few people that did um, offer to talk to me uh, did so as long as I didn't mention their names sort of thing. And um, yeah, I gave it, they gave sort of interesting sort of scenarios as to what could have happened. Is there a case that's grabbed you or stayed with you or affected you the most? A lot of them do when you get personally involved with the investigations but um, probably the Craig Hampton one springs to mind. He was a, a surfer guy who disappeared and um, well coming up 20 years ago in mm. Wellington. Uh, he his mate was over from Australia and they planned for the long week Wellington anniversary weekend to go for a surf on Wellington's coast and, and he never turned up for that surf meeting. Um, but his car was seen um, outside a house in Arthur Street in Wellington mm. and um, and he was seen in the company of a, of a gentleman who um, has been interviewed um, when I did the, the TV series The Missing. Mm. We did catch up with the, the guy who was last sort of officially seen with him. And it's a chap that I've gone back to talk to as well because his story seems his stories over the years seem inconsistent That's with right. what he actually originally told police. We've run out of time, so if you need to know more about this, you're gonna have to get the book and have a good read of it. Scott, thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having the me. The Missing Files is sold exclusively through Paper Plus, Paper Plus Select and Take Note. And you can find out more info about, about Scott and his work on his website.